So um, this is where we left off the last time that this is Kepler's big realization that what everyone has been assuming for a very long time is not right. That whatever is doing the moving, whether it's the planets, uh, whether it's the Earth that's moving around the sun, or whether it's the sun moving around the Earth, that everyone had been assuming they, they move in a circle. Uh, like no one questioned that, but what Ptolemy, this Kepler, what Kepler discovered was that they don't move in a circle. They move in an ellipse. That's very close to the circle, but not quite. Yes? Um, how did you find out like, in circle is wrong? So this is the one that I didn't quite give you all the detail. But let me give you an, an example of the theorem that I was describing. So um, this is a geometric theorem that you might have heard in your geometry class. If you have a circle, then um, if you have some, let's say, arc length, that uh, goes over some, you know, you can describe by some angle theta. And if you inscribe this angle, do you know how this angle relates to that angle? Yeah. This angle is theta over 2. Yeah? There was a theorem in your geometry class that proved it. And you can um, show other similar things. So that, um, so you know, this is the simplest possible example that I can think of. So that you know, when you have an um, angle like this, and you are told, you know, it's um, it's an arc length of circle of some radius, and you know the you know the distance here, so that you can calculate this angle theta as l over r. Then you can immediately figure out, oh, this angle here is going to be half that. There's a theorem that tells you that. So um, what I'm saying is that uh, Kepler also, he proved uh, theorems that will help him compare these uh, actual observations to the position of the planet in the model. So he had a predicted position based on uh, assuming that, or not predicted position, it's more like a, a feature of the uh, orbit. It's, yeah, there was some feature of the orbit that assuming the path was circular, this um, when you calculate something, it had to come out to be a value, and it wasn't. That's when he, and because Brahe collected such a accurate data, he knew that the uh, magnitude of error, it was outside of any experimental error by Brahe. So, um, because Kepler had been his assistant, he knew that data was trustworthy, so when he had a, uh, model that contradicted with what the data said with some significant amount of analysis, he was able to say, all right, so this theory must be wrong. It must not be circle. I have to go look for something else. Yeah, yeah. So he didn't actually, um, he didn't immediately know that well, it was an ellipse because um, that's sort of harder to prove. But I think he did a, yeah, I'm trying to give a very general description of something that takes a lot of work. So. Let's say, so Kep, this is Kepler's biggest discovery. Let me write down the next two uh, of Kepler's laws. And I guess this is what I want you to think about. So, you know, somebody tells you that this is the big discovery, and you think, all right, so I take this model, and I just have to adjust it a little bit. So this path, even though they are ellipse, you can see from here they are very close to a circle. So the adjustment I would have to make is, Instead of placing the sun at the center, I'll have to just move the sun somewhere off to the side so that uh, it's a one of the focus of these ellipses. Well, if that's what you're thinking, read these next two laws of uh, um, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The second law of planetary motion says this. Um, I'll give you the traditional statement first, and then I will tell you a version that's a lot easier to understand. So it says uh, line connecting sun and a planet that can be Earth or Mars or anything um, sweeps equal area in equal time. I think this statement is. Um, 
a little bit difficult to figure out exactly what it means, even for those of us who have taken calculus and all that, had more math than Kepler did, in fact. So uh, let me state, uh, restate this in a slightly different way. This is how you could state it. Um, so imagine a planet at perihelion, right? Um, imagine that it's moving at some speed of v, then the area, let's say over a period of uh, two days or a week, this would be the area that, uh, that's swept by the line connecting from the planet to the sun. Okay? Uh, let me actually exaggerate it a little bit. Let's say you are observing it for a month. So let's say this is the area that's swept by that line. And if you consider this planet again, when it's at the aphelion, so it's farther away from the sun. Let me get rid of the wrong Copernican sun. Um, so it's farther away. So how do you think this angle will be different if our requirement is that it uh, covers the equal area in equal time? Like larger angle, same angle, larger angle, smaller angle. Smaller angle, right? It's like, you know, you, if your pizza radius is larger, you need a smaller slice to the same amount of pizza. Um, so, so that's what it says. So if uh, um, the planet is moving at some velocity at the perihelion, and you look at how fast it's moving at the aphelion, and uh, based on this picture, you would say uh, velocity at aphelion is is smaller than the velocity at the perihelion, right? In fact, there's a very, even more specific relationship than that. Uh, I won't prove it, I'll just state it. Um, so if you have some radius, distance, uh, uh, radius at perihelion, and you have some distance um, at aphelion, then what to said here? Mathematically, it comes down to this statement that the product of the um, RP and VP, product of radius at uh, perihelion times velocity at perihelion is equal to the radius at aphelion times velocity at aphelion. If you're trying to imagine how this might be true, this is what I would uh, ask you to imagine. Imagine that in both cases, you are multiplying them by some duration of time delta t. Then this would cover the area, uh, the length traveled by the planet, right? And this would cover the length traveled by the planet in same amount of time. And uh, what it is saying is that uh, they both have a more or less the same geometrical shape. So the you know, one measure of length times the other perpendicular measure of length which gives you some idea of area. Imagine it's an area of a triangle as an approximation. Then this area of triangle is the same, so that makes the, this product same as this product. Okay. But the rule I want to boil down to is that when the planet is at its perihelion and the aphelion, we can hold on to this relationship. It's equivalent to what this statement of second law is saying, except it's more mathematical expression that we can do something with. Okay. okay, let me state the third of the Kepler's law of planetary motion. So the third law, it says this. Um, so first and second law actually deals with a, a single planet. You could apply first law to Mars, and second law also to just Mars, right? So you know when you look at the orbit of Mars here, you could use the first law to say, okay, it's on an ellipse with the sun at one of the fo two foci. And uh, you look at the speed of the Mars as it's going around its own orbit. You say when it's closer to the sun, it's moving faster than when it's farther away from the sun. Okay? So first and second law both deal with the, each of these planets individually. The third law is different in this sense. It, um, it deals with this, uh, it, it compares two different planets. Specifically, it compares a planet at one orbit with another planet at a different orbit. So call this planet one, call this planet two. This is what the third law says. 
it says. Um, it says that the period and the radius, or the, I guess, average radius, because it's in an ellipse. Um, so something like a radius, call it semi-major axis or whatever. So something like radius of the orbit are related. Well, how are they related? Um, I always forget this. Um, let me try to get this right. Um, so I feel like period, let me call that T, period cubed is, no, sorry, um, period squared is proportional to called radius R, radius cubed. Um, it's a very mysterious relationship. Um, it's a, here's one meaning I can give it to you. Um, what would you have said if I said, um, if I said uh, period is proportional to radius? Or if I even said that period, is, period squared is proportional to radius squared? Like what would you have said? Like, um, uh, what, how would you imagine the motion of the planet so that it's consistent with these two rules? Hmm? Sorry, what? Uh, well, it's not exactly one to one. It's two different quantities. Period is time, radius is distance. So it's not, like, I don't know what one to one means. Um, so, well, this is something that you can say. I'll just give it to you. I'm kind of running out of time. So, if, the, the, if they were proportional like this, that what I would conclude from knowing this is that the, the velocity of the planets must be the same. As in, how fast Mars is moving. Look at how fast it's moving, it's velocity. And look at how fast the, oops, that's the stars. Um, look at how fast the Saturn is moving. And if they have the same velocity, then this relationship between period and radius would make sense. Because you double the radius, for example, then the amount of distance you have to travel is now double. So if you're moving at the same speed, then, well, it would take you double the time. So you, you would, your period would double. That's what any of these two relationships would have said. Now, that's not what Kepler's law says. What Kepler's law says is that if your radius doubles, then the right-hand side, it's a, you know, octopus. It's multiplied by eight. And then you take only a square root, meaning, um, the period actually more than doubles. So what Kepler's third law is saying, in an intuitive conceptual, at a conceptual level, is that if Mars is moving at some particular speed, planets that are outer in the farther orbit, they actually travel slower. So, uh, so let me write it down. So, um, so, so you know, this is the statement of Kepler's law, but it's a little bit hard to understand what it really means without doing a bunch of math. Um, so what it means is that a planet on larger orbit move slower. And so these are Kepler's laws. And let me ask you this question. Would you have guessed Second law and third law from knowing that, um, where's my point, laser pointer? I always misplace it. No one saw me, put, ah, thank you. Um, so would you have guessed the second and third law from knowing that the plan, orbit of the planet is actually ellipse? Like, is this something that sounds intuitively true? 
No, like this is uh, th like Kepler's second and third law, and probably even Kepler's first law. It's not intuitive. It's not something anybody would come up with, just sitting in your own room, just thinking of how the universe should operate. And you wouldn't think, oh, yeah, universe should operate in a way that the line connecting sun and a planet sweeps equal area in equal time. Like, that's a crazy rule. Like, you wouldn't think that should be the rule. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of law that you can only come up with if you had the data to analyze. If you actually put in the hard work, you know, you did the hard work of hypothesizing, testing it against the data, revising your hypothesis. That's the only thing that would uh, get you this result. And it took Kepler like three years to work out all of this and publish it. So um, I actually want to connect some of this to what you already know. Um, so the second law, Kepler's second law, one of the benefits of doing this so late in the semester is that you have actually learn, learned the principle of uh, the law of nature that corresponds to Kepler's second law. So, you might notice that you know, we, this is the first time we are talking about this. None of the mechanics that we do <coughs> actually comes from this. It's because Newton has found a more fundamental law. You already know three of those, Newton's laws of motion. Newton's first, second, and third law of motion. That's one of the set of fundamental laws of nature. And the second of the fundamental law of nature is the Newton's law of universal gravitation that we are going to talk about. So, because we know those fundamental laws of nature, we haven't really talked about any of this because it's sort of unnecessary. Um, but these are important, I feel, as a history lesson and what real science looks like. So, yeah, I'm gonna sound dismissive again. Neither of these are real science, at least they are not modern science. That's why I said modern astronomy begins here. It's because, you know, a lot of this involved a lot of philosophizing not really testing your model against the data. And um, well, um, <laughs> this is what real science looks like. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, so one of the benefits of the results like this, even though it's not the fundamental law, I can actually derive this from a fundamental law of nature. And the fundamental principle of nature is this. Where this comes from is conservation of what do you think might be getting conserved here? Hmm? Energy, hmm. Yeah, but it's going to be difficult to calculate the potential energy before I introduce Newton's law of universal gravitation. Because you have to know the form of a force. To, because the distance is changing, so you have to know how your potential energy is changing. Now, does it look like your momentum is conserved? No, here it has downward velocity, downward momentum. Here it has upward velocity, upward momentum. Now, if you look at the momentum of the planet and the sun, they are conserved. But you know, sun is so much heavier that like, it doesn't seem to be moving at all. Um, OK, so that leaves only one remaining quantity that can possibly be conserved. Yeah. Angular momentum. So this, uh, you can actually derive it from conservation of angular momentum. Uh, let me multiply uh, this equation with one quantity to help you see that. It's, uh, that one quantity should be, hmm, I think it should be mass of the planet. So multiply this by the mass of the planet and that will give you the expression that you need. Let me write up the cleaned up version here. So with the m multiplying to all of this, left hand side will be radius at the perihelion times, let me group the next two quantities together, mass of the planet times the velocity at the perihelion. Well, let me finish writing it up. It looks like radius at the aphelion times mass times velocity again mass times the velocity at the aphelion. What does this underlined quantity look like? Momentum of the uh, planet, right? So momentum of the planet at the perihelion and momentum of the planet at the aphelion. So actually, the, even the magnitude of the momentum is not constant. It will be changing. <coughs> 
Um, and these are what I would call they are lever arm. As in the perpendicular distance from the center of rotation to the, uh, to the velocity this time. So this is a lever arm. This is a, another lever arm. So what does this look, look like? Lever arm times momentum. Well, lever arm times the force is the torque. But this is a relationship that uh, force is to momentum the way torque is to this quantity. Someone other than Abdi. So, um, so f how is force related to momentum? How is the force related to momentum? No, not through work. Work is uh, something to do with the energy. This is something, momentum, it's uh, something entirely different. It's uh, the rate of change of momentum. Yeah, force is rate of change of momentum. If you don't have this memorized by now, read it through the book again. Uh, because you ought to have this memorized. Force is rate of change of momentum. And torque is rate of change of what? Linear. Not linear. Well, I don't know why you keep saying linear. So what is torque rate of change of? Angular. angular momentum. That's the analogy. So torque is the angular version of force. So the thing that's related to torque the same way. So you know, here is the level arm times momentum gives you, well, so lever arm times force is torque. So lever arm times momentum is angular momentum. Yeah, I keep saying to you guys, uh, with the rotation, you really have to understand all these quantities thoroughly. If you're just trying to memorize the formulas or whatever, um, you're going to forget some connection. But if you understand them, um, I mean, this portion is relevant for your exam too. Um, if, if you actually understand the quantities intuitively, then you don't have to memorize a bunch of formulas. Um, so anyways, this is, so this quantity here is angular momentum. And the equation I've written down here, what it's saying is that, well, angular momentum is conserved. And here the angular momentum is conserved because as this planet's going around the sun, there's no external torque on the planet. Any force on the planet, is pointed towards the sun. So there's no lever arm, lever arm is zero. So that's why as the planet goes in its orbit, its angular momentum is conserved. And that's what, uh, that, so that's the that's equivalent to statement to the second um, of law of uh, Kepler's law. Yeah. And uh, third one, I don't think we'll have time to do this one, so I'll just leave it there. Um, third one, I, you can actually prove it, um, let me give this to you as one of the homework exercises when I finally assign homework for exam three. Um, you can do this using standard strategy um, because it's a circular. Um, so for the special case of where it's a circular motion, you can work this out for circular motion using uh, analysis of the centripetal force. And what we are going to be talking about in the remaining 20 minutes of this class, Newton's law of universal gravitation. 